this. So as people just gonna admit everyone, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Zoom session um, titled, hello, Islamicum. Right, welcome to Islamic Courses Zoom session, session titled Trojan Horse Muslim Education in Mainstream Schools and Politics. Uh, we have uh, Tahir Alam, Aka the Trojan Horse, who's the former education advisor to the Muslim Council of Britain. And we're very privileged to have also Dr. Shamim Mia from the University of Huddersfield, who is also uh, an author on uh, two books in particular related to the subject, Muslim schooling and the question of self-segregation and Muslims and the question of security, Trojan Horse prevent and racialize politics. Before we start, just want to go over some of the housekeeping rules. Um, it is being recorded. So everybody who's come in, automatically you'll be on mute. Uh, you won't be able to unmute, only I will be able to unmute you. Um, number one. Number two, as I said, if you're not registered, um, please leave your address, email address on the chat and we'll send you a copy of the recording. There is a Q&A session, but you have to write the questions down on the chat. We'll also accept questions from uh, the Zoom as well directly, so it shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a problem. Okay, so uh, without further ado, those are the housekeeping rules. I think I will formally start. Um, as, as you're all aware, um, I think it was in 2000 and, um, 2014, the Trojan Affair, um, uh, the Trojan Affair issue broke out and it was an alleged plot to Islamify several state schools, in particular Birmingham, and then later on across the country, and it caused a previously highly successful school to be vilified. So, um, and there have been major injustices over the course of the years, inflicted not only to teachers, but also on the pupils and the whole issue of Muslims in schools, in state schools. And the affair was really used to criticize, to criticize multiculturalism and justify the expansion of a broad and intrusive counter extreme ed agenda. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand uh, over to uh, Ustad Tahir Alam, um, who was apparently um, the pie, well, the man behind the whole affair. So without further ado, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Tahir Alam, Ramadan Kareem. Jazakallah uh, khair and Ramadan Kareem to everybody listening as well and uh, good to be on. Thank you. So, Bismillah. So, what what exactly happened, and uh, and what's been the impact, and what's the significance of this? So, we've got about 10, yeah. 10, 10 minutes or so to Bismillah. Yeah, yeah. just to sort of in, uh, highlight some of the main things. I mean, what what was it all about? Uh, with respect to schools, uh, mainstream schools and education, what we had in this country since the Education Reform Act, uh, nineteen eighty eight. That's John Major's government. They introduced, uh, you know, often inspections in this country and also what was called the stakeholder model. Uh, that was the local management of schools. That system was introduced. And according to that system, the idea based on democratic kind of principles was that people whose children come to the school from the locality could get involved in the schools as governors and, you know, have, have an influence, have a say in how their children being, were being educated and also to be able to hold the schools to account with respect to academic performance and other issues that may arise from that. So that's the system we had. Now I became a governor in uh, the school to which I went myself as a child as well. And I thought it's a local school. I will get involved in that. And that school was actually, in 1992, that school was rated as the uh, second worst school in the whole country with only a single child passing, a single child passing what we might call a benchmark of A stars to C, including English and maths, what it used to be called then. So that was the state of the school. It'd been failing, it, it had been failing for a couple of decades, year in, year out. It was a complete DOS house. And everybody, uh, including Ofsted, including the local education authority, the Department of Education, if I was, if, you know, quite frankly, they couldn't really care less, really, whether these children passed or they failed. You know, the school was just kind of left to it. Then in the late 90s, I got involved in schools and I thought I'd try and do something about these things. And uh, we, uh, we, in, in sort of with other parents as well, being involved at the same time. So we got involved in this school called Parkview School, uh, which is now called Rockwood School. And we took the results of this school from when we joined the school from 4% 
to uh, 75 percent, including English and maths. And our results were, uh, were consistently in the 70s. Now, this was um, the transformation that we brought about, you know, over a period of time. Um, but then uh, sort of, uh, and th those have been the results. And obviously, we've been encouraging people to get involved in the schools, to play an important role in the schools, or parents to be involved, and so on. Obviously, the school that we served was 90, you know, 99% Muslim pupil population. So what happened was that our school was quite well known and quite uh, popular um, and in demand as well. And then the Department of Education gave us some other schools to run as well, because we were very successful at what we did. And then uh, came the uh, uh, conservative uh, government change in 2010, and you know there was a shift in policy, from what I can sort of see really. And in in 2014, um, the Trojan Horse affair broke out, and that's when I was accused, and our schools were accused of, you know, Islamizing the schools and turning them into uh, Islamic schools when we didn't have the status. There was too much religion in the school. But the actual headlines in the papers actually were far worse than that, of course. They were talking about, you know, promoting extremism, terrorism, and all kinds of pictures of people with, um, you know, bombs and things were printed in some papers. A whole hysteria was generated over, you know, uh, and was sustained, in fact, for something like five, six months. And um, what were actually very, very successful schools, uh, Parkview School, Nansen Academy, as well as Golden Hillock Academy, uh, these were high-performing schools when we were running them, and then the interventions came, and these were primarily um, uh, inspired by, if you like, or pushed by um, the then Secretary of State for Education, Michael Gove, you know, who was, um, as far as I understand, was personally driving the whole um, agenda uh, behind these interventions, and what it turned out in the end was, was a complete witch hunt. In the end, you know, there was no plot proved. Um, the, all the teachers, you know, walked free from court because the Department for Education and the, um, the uh, um, education funding agency, it was, it was found that they actually had deliberately, um, you know, hidden evidence that should have been presented in court. So the whole thing was biased. The whole thing was, uh, you know, unfair from A to Z. And they wanted to prove something for which there was no evidence, there was no proof, but they continue to beat the drums. So this political intervention, you know, done a lot of damage. So in the end, you know, the, the, the schools were handed, handed uh, back to the state, as it were, and subsequent to that. So what happened to these schools after they were um, taken over, if you like, uh, by other people and uh, people like myself and others were involved, they were forced out. Well, these schools results actually, I mean, if I go to say last year's results, um, um, you know, the results were down to 41% uh, from 75%. So what were highly successful schools have become failing schools. Um, and, um, you know, Ofsted are okay with that. The Department of Education are okay with that. Everybody's okay with that. Now that these schools are now uh, essentially, you know, I mean, mediocre schools or significantly underachieving schools at least and are nowhere near where they were. Uh, so without me sort of saying any more, uh, that was the uh, you know that was the episode, and people may remember that from the media and so on. But the, the, the last point I want to sort of um, uh, mention here is that this whole episode has had a lasting impact on the education of Muslim children, the involvement of Muslim governors, the involvement of Muslim parents, and Muslims being able to uh, you know hold the local schools to account, being able to participate in those schools, has been shaped, if you like, now and continues to be by, by, by the various legislation which was passed, including the, uh, the statutorization of PREVENT, where there is monitoring and observation of uh, children and the, uh, there's an obligation on schools to report um, you know, extremism. And we've had some bizarre cases of extremism being reported. Children wanting, to, wanting prayer rooms have been reported that, oh, this child may be radicalized uh, because they requested a prayer room. So an atmosphere has been created which actually uh, has uh, effectively marginalized Muslims, isolated Muslims within the education sector. So that has been the lasting impact and that continues. It's not gone anywhere. Most people might think, well, you know, the episode is over, but its sustained impact, you know, continues to affect the achievement of Muslim children, 
the, I, w I would say, the respect and the dignity of Muslim children being able to express their identity and who they are within schools and be themselves uh, is also impacted by these things. And uh, a, a culture of surveillance has been created and um, the legislation, you know, further cementing this uh, surveillance culture in 2015, the justification for that uh, that was cited was in fact um, the Trojan horse affair, as if there's some reality to the whole thing. Uh, the fact of the matter is that on the ground, uh, these schools were, you know, run by people who were not of the Islamic faith background. Our head teacher, our chief executive, was uh, an atheist and a feminist as well, and our other principal was a Sikh person, actually. So I was accused, really, of, um, and people are expected to believe that uh, I was running an Islamic plot with uh, these people actually fronting the whole thing. Uh, well, you know, uh, so, so these are some of the uh, things that, you know, I want to just put forward as an opening discussion. Thank you so much. And, and what has been, in, uh, to this date, what's been the impact on the children and the parents and the community? Just out of interest. Yeah, I mean, the schools that, uh, if, I, if I begin with the schools that, we, uh, the, that were run by us, which are the Parkview Education Trust schools, all these three schools are now uh, substantially failing schools. Uh, in fact, those schools have now been the, the organization that was running it, uh, the primary Nansen Academy, which is uh, probably the biggest academy in primary academy in Europe, probably, maybe, uh, that particular uh, academy has now been taken away from them because its results were, you know, so uh, appalling that uh, even with them being favorites within the Department for Education, the schools were taken away from them. Their results were uh, national, if I give you a rough idea, so just not to complicate things, mm -hmm. but if the national average was, say, 70%, these schools' results were 35%. So, so there is the difference. So these schools have failed an entire cohort. This mean a, it's been a five years of failure. And unfortunately, this failure will continue for, if they, unless there is intervention, mm -hmm. uh, this failure is going to continue uh, you know, maybe for decades to come, which was the case before we did get involved as well, to be frank. And can you just remind the significance of this? Because obviously, how many Muslims are in state schools? Remember, we had a session yesterday, um, only a small percentage of Muslims are in Islamic schools. And Alhamdulillah, which is fantastic, and then doing some great, great work. But what's the percentage? What's the percentage of, um, what's the percentage of Muslims in state but, schools? Yeah, my estimation would be, if I give you some ballpark figures, really, they're not, obviously, I don't run the uh, National Statistical Survey or anything here, but if I give some rough figures, so given our appreciation for it, um, there are some 800,000 children in, in uh, full-time schooling in this country, 800,000. Of those, um, only about, say, 5 6%, uh, 6% of the children will go to, uh, do actually go to Muslim schools. Um, and 95% of them, you know, approach 95% approximately go to normal state schools. And uh, where there are large Muslim conurbations like Birmingham, for example, uh, we have something like 50 to 60 schools, which are, you know, more than 90% Muslim pupil population. Um, so, so, uh, so there are, the numbers involved are, you know, uh, quite huge. So when we talk about the impact, actually, we're not talking about small numbers. We're talking about very large numbers here. We're talking about large numbers, but the, the impact has been quite significant. And we'll come back to, we'll come back to you uh, during the questions and answers session. Right. OK, so I'm going to hand it over to now uh, to our second guest, Dr. Shami Mia from the University of um, Huddersfield. And so, inshallah, if you can just, uh, um, you've written two books and you've investigated the whole Trojan, uh, Trojan horse affair as well. The, one of the books, Muslims, Schooling and the Question of Self-Segregation, Muslims and the Questions of Security, Trojan Horse, Prevent and Racialized Politics. Um, it's up to you if you want to talk a little bit about the two books and then relating it to the Trojan horse affair. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, Ramadan Kareem. Uh, my energy level tends to dip at this time, this time of the afternoon. So, but uh, I'll, I'll 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 try my best. Um, okay. So, uh, what I'd like to do um, is to kind of offer a, a more bigger 
a perspective really um, and um, trying to kind of unpick some of the meanings behind the Trojan horse saga um, and also trying to look, kind of look at some of the logic uh, behind uh, the way in which the Trojan horse saga was actually kind of discussed and debated within the media but also within the kind of wider context. Now I was um, a, interested in the Trojan horse saga like most kind of uh, a, a readers who was following the news but most of my work colleagues kept on telling me that they smell a, a rat um, and most of the other kind of colleagues that I'd kind of interact with also they were basically they, they were they they weren't necessarily happy with the received narratives from the media um, so that kind of got me thinking about the topic and perhaps to write a, a journal article like most academics do I thought I could actually sit down and get a journal article out but the more that I started to read around it the more kind of documents that can kind of start to kind of uh, a, um, a being published I thought well this is a major major scandal um, I that needed to be uh, scrutinized uh, from the academic kind of viewpoint um, but in doing so trying to ask the questions does the Trojan horse saga hold up to academic scrutiny so that's 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 a big question that I was kind of asking asking myself so that's that's the kind of the broad context um, but what I'd like to do is just to offer some uh, broad headlines first before kind of I, I start to drill down on the on the specifics so let's take the first point. The first point is, is that I think that the Trojan Hall saga is a major, major a, um, milestone within the debate around race, ethnicity, and Muslim students. So within an academic context, it's a really major milestone. Um, because hitherto, um, the way in which Muslims were talked about within the academic discourse was very much through the lenses of segregation, assimilation, multiculturalism, anti-racism, etc, etc. With the Trojan horse saga, you have a different way in which Muslims were looked at. They were looked at from the point of view of security. Yeah, so it was, it was a security issue. No longer was it multiculturalism, anti-racism, now it became Muslim then became a security threat. So that's the first thing. The second point is that, that I, I think uh, I, um, Brother Tahir already mentioned, that the Trojan horse continues and shapes and influences education of policy discourse throughout, throughout uh, the UK, but also within the, European, within the European context as well. So the logic of Tro Trojan horse, and I'll start to unpick what I mean by the logic, what, what, what exactly do we mean by the logic of the Trojan horse, I still continues to kind of shape the way in which we kind of talk about Muslims. So for example, there is a direct correlation between the Trojan horse, the Counterterrorism Security Act, and the legal duty of schools of promoting uh, British values, etc. So that, that, that there is a kind of direct kind of correlation, there is a direct kind of logic, if you like. Um, but also I think the Trojan horse offers a, a moment where the liberal mask slips um, within academic context. So usually what, what you have is a, a mask that actually gives indication that Britain is a very tolerant society, it's a very inclusive society, it's a very multicultural society, et cetera. And what the Trojan horse basically does, it, it allows that kind of mask to slip. And once the mask actually slips, you basically are able to actually see how far racism and the logic of racism is kind of embedded within the state apparatus. Um, so often we, when we're talking about racism, Islamophobia, et cetera, the image that we have in our mind is the far right BMP, uh, EDL, etc. We don't necessarily associate the logic of racism within the state apparatus. So I think that basically when the mask slips, the liberal mask slips, you're able to actually see how 
to an extent that racism is basically embedded within the state. Yeah. And within academic discourse, people actually talk about, you know, the racial logic, they talk about the racial state and how racism and Islamophobia is embedded both in its policy, its procedure, and also the way in which the state actually governs Muslim affairs. So that's, that's perhaps the third thing. Um, have I got more time just to go through the specifics by, or, or do you want me to just pause here and, or? No, 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 go ahead. We've got plenty of time, okay. plenty of time, there's no Okay, problem. so that's just to, just to set the scene. Now, if I was just to basically just talk about some of the issues that I basically found quite intriguing as far as my, my research is concerned. Now, let me just talk a little bit about my methodology of the book. The book wasn't interested in interviewing, um, you know, head teachers, uh, it wasn't interested in interviewing governors, etc. And although that's a very important research mechanism, what I basically was interested in doing is looking at the Ofsted inspection reports, all of the, the 21 Ofsted inspection reports, and also doing a, a, um, a, a, a background a, a analysis of all the Ofsted inspection reports that actually was published before that in those respective schools. Uh, I was able to analyze within, within academic talks, discourse, doing a discourse analysis of all the government and also the select committee report that basic was actually published. So it's basically looking at secondary source material, but all the published data uh, that was actually kind of available on that. And then I was able to actually identify a number of issues really. So the first and the, perhaps the most important thing to bear in mind as far as the Trojan horse saga is concerned is that it's not an event. The Trojan horse is not an event. Rather, Trojan horse is a process through which Muslims are actually essentialized and demonized and they become racialized outsiders. So that's the first and most important thing. Trojan horse is not an event, but rather the process. And through this process, Muslims are constructed as the other. So that's, that's, the, that's perhaps important. The second thing that I was interested in is developing a theory that allows us to make sense of what the Trojan horse was all about. So I did a number of a, a research around different theoretical, theoretical perspectives. And one perspective that I found was quite compelling was what's known as the Copenhagen model of securitization. And what the Copenhagen model uh, a, a uh, approach of securitization talks about is how security is not something which is real, but rather security is something which is constructed. And it's constructed through discourse. It's constructed through media reports. It's constructed through government interventions, etc. So the security threat isn't something which is real, but rather something which is constructed. And you can actually see how that actually kind of plays out. So for example, uh, Brother Tahir has already mentioned, you know, you've got the Education Select Committee. One of the first paragraphs of the Select Committee basically talks about that there is no evidence, yeah, of a sustained plot, you know, a Trojan horse plot. There is no a, a, a clear evidence that basically came out that there was a, a, a jihadist attempt to take over the school, etc. So you have a a disconnect. On the one hand, you have all this media talking about a jihadist threat, and then on the other hand, you've got these uh, a, um, a documentation that basically said that there isn't this threat whatsoever. So what you can actually take from that is this notion of how security is basically constructed, and how security is actually constructed within within discourse, yeah, within talks, and how basically people actually talk about certain certain phenomena. So let's just drill down uh, onto one or two of the specifics. First thing, Ofsted inspection of all of the schools, yeah, um, didn't follow the, the Ofsted inspection handbook. That was quite clear. What it did was to use the prevent logic as a way of uh, assessing the schools. Now this was before the Ofsted inspection handbook basically internalized the, the logic of prevent. So that was the first thing. The second thing basically what you find is that the Department of Education basically securitized the logic. So they had someone with no experience in education, yeah, a, 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 a specialist in security, yeah, 
to basically do uh, the, the report on the Trojan horse. Yeah? Um, but also here you've got a certain logic that comes out of how the, um, the, bla uh, how the, 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 the problems of some Muslims are then blamed yeah, uh, onto the, the actions of all of the Muslims. So this is a kind of classical conflation, if you like, of, 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 of some of the issues. Uh, and then you've got certain statements by Nicky Morgan, Sir Michael Wilshaw, et cetera. They say, look, they did not find any evidence. You know, where is the smoking gun? There was no smoking gun. There's no clear cut evidence to basically link or to connect, you know, the Trojan horse and the jihadist kind of entryism, if you like. Instead, basically what we find is the conflation that basically takes place on the one hand with extremism, with cultural conservatism with, with, with the other. And it also assumes that cultural conservatism is a monopoly of Muslims. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily recognize that, that there are cultural conservatives within various other uh, a, a, you know, religious faiths as well, uh, within the Jewish community, within, within Christian communities, etc. So um, also what we find is that there's shifting of goalposts as well. You know, there's a classical example of one of the Ofsted report that basically says, look, this is the smoking gun. Yeah, it basically says that Saudi, you know, students from one of the secondary schools takes a, a group of students to Saudi Arabia. Boom, these, this is seen as a classical example of, you know, uh, radicalization without actually identifying that the same Ofsted inspection using the same framework basically praised the school, yeah, of the exactly the same issue. So when you've got this, the shifting of goalposts basically happening as well. So hopefully that's just giving you a, a kind of sense, if you like, of how, what we've basically moved away from some of the discussions about multiculturalism and how we basically have ended up in a position where Muslims have become, you know, securitized um, within, 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 within the dynamic of, 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 of education. And I think that's deeply, deeply problematic. Not necessarily in the way in which Muslims are actually viewed, but also the way in which that allows various other policies to basically kind of uh, a, a define Muslims as, as a, a potential problem, but also as, as a potential kind of racialized kind of outsider. So hopefully, I mean, I mean, we can get into the specifics afterwards, but I just thought that that, that broader kind of context would be quite, you know, quite useful. Thank you so much, Dr. Shamim, and that was very insightful. Um, Brother Tahir, I'm going to bring you back. Are there any, um, as we can see, you know, the securitizations of, um, we're living in a multicultural society as minorities. Also. Do you think that's also being, um, is there some sort of, um, uh, policy across Europe, around the world. Do, are we seeing similar sort of things? Uh, I, uh, there's, there's one question here. Uh, another question is, are you exaggerating the issue? I mean, Muslims are still going to school, they're getting by, they're doing their GCSEs and A-levels. There seems to be no problem. There's another question coming through. Yeah, so questions are coming through now. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, the issue, the issue of uh, securitization of education is an important uh, point. Uh, and this uh, is the ongoing issue here, mm. that Muslims' uh, children uh, are not even spared. Uh, so I don't think I'm exaggerating. We've seen, even in the recent um, uh, case of the uh, case with the um, Mr. Andrew Muffet and the LGBT agenda in schools, for example, and they were in Birmingham schools as well. We saw how, you know, very very. Uh, straightforward requests by parents for information for them to be kept informed were then misconstrued by the school itself, um, including people from prevent. Uh, I mean, they got involved as well. We know this evidentially. And in that particular school, the the the, the parents, the Muslim parents, were predominantly vilified for raising what are very very legitimate concerns. So this entire securitization issue has actually cemented itself. It is the ongoing issue. There's no, there's no exaggeration. These things are very, very real. So in this particular school, I'm just saying nice because it's more recent. The yeah. Trojan Horse Affairs was six years ago. Uh, it is a live situation now. And you could test this scenario. Uh, and if parents are listening, you can test the scenario. Mm -hmm. 
if you go to your local primary school and your secondary school and make a request for a prayer room, see what the reaction is. Because as soon as you request a prayer room in the school um, or a facility for Friday prayer, um, which, is, which is something that's been happening you know, in a lot of schools for many, many years, and it's been quite a normal part of the, uh, part of the setup. Now, if you make such a simple request, nothing to do with extremists or anything, that now has to go through the person who is responsible for prevent in the school. That'll be referred to prevent. And then they will look at that if this permission can be granted or not. Now, we know this from, uh, I, I know I've uh, dealt with a number of cases and I advise on them now, mm -hmm. where, where this is what is actually happening. In one of the schools, in primary school, the school refused. They said, oh, we're not. Uh, so they consulted uh, whoever they're supposed to consult. So this is Muslim children, even four, five, six-year-olds are being seen through the prism of security, through the prism of terrorism, and through the prism of radicalization. Uh, you know, in my estimation, this is a very poor model of education, really, where you don't even spare children. Uh, so what happened to the idea of children being themselves and having certain freedoms and being allowed to make mistakes even. Sure. So, so this kind of culture you know, has created um, a culture where parents actually are telling their children, don't discuss Islam in school. Right. Yeah, yeah. Don't express your views about Islam in school at all. And this is very, very prevalent because they just think that they're gonna be uh, misconstrued or misrepresented in the wrong way. And there's good reasons for having that fear. I'm not saying every school is doing that, but there's good grounds for doing that. So take the school uh, that was involved in this um, LGBT promotion, so where children were being told that you can go, you can, you can, you know, be a boy or a girl, and uh, it's fine. Four-year-old children were being told that. Take that school as an example. They have a case on record, uh, which they refer to prevent, because at a uh, you know a a ten-year-old boy, uh, he went on a trip with the school, and uh, on the trip he said, uh, sir you know, can I have a place where I can pray? So he wanted to perform his salah basically on a trip. Next thing you know, you know is the school actually is um, showing off, if you like, um, uh, its approach to dealing with radicalization and extremism. And this particular child is then referred to prevent by the school because he simply made a request um, uh, on, the, on, uh, on a school trip that he wanted to pray while they were, you know, wondering about going places, you know, whatever. We have so an international audience. If you want to explain very quickly what, what yeah. that is, because we've got folks yeah. from America, we've got folks from Indonesia, Malaysia, Turkey, Europe. Yeah. Very I mean, Kirk Hedinger, so yeah, so uh, Prevent is, is, a, is a government program which actually uh, uh, seeks to, you know, prevent violent extremism, radicalization, uh, you know, primarily within the Muslim community, um, and 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 that has been statutorized. So every school is required to monitor, if you like, its pupils for any signs of radicalization, any signs of extremism. So in this particular case, so that the child, a ten-year-old child, wants to pray is seen as uh, rather odd because you know, ten-year-old child should not be praying in their estimation, in their according to their sort of very secular mindset, if you like, they think this, oh, this is a, a bit odd, actually. This is a, a sign of radicalization. Why would 10-year-old, 10-year-old should be wanting to play on the uh, PS3 uh, and, and uh, wanting to play football or cricket or whatever sport. That's what they should be interested in. Why are they interested in religion? So, so this is the prism through which the Muslim community is being seen. Um, and and uh, and and uh, so so that's the situation really. So so you can see that there's no exaggeration here. Mm -hmm. We can test this scenario in live situations, mm -hmm. and I challenge anybody to uh, you know get together with me if they want to do that. We'll pick a pick a school, and we'll put certain requests through for prayer facilities and see how the school responds. We had one school here locally in Birmingham, yeah. which had 98% Muslim pupil population. And because of this policy of discrimination, where Muslims are seen through the prism of radicalization, terrorism, and so on, um, you know, seven, six actually, primary school children were basically forced to open their fast right. uh, because the school felt that they should not be fasting. So when the parents confronted them, they denied all knowledge of it. They said, no, no, we didn't do anything. 
So they started telling a pack of lies. Right. But then we checked the previous year as well with other children, and they've been doing this systematically. They've been harassing, shouting, isolating children, and forcing them to open their fasts. Was that an isolated so, case, or was that the... Was it other no, schools? it's not an isolated case, but I'm saying to you that we can produce this kind of... Um, some schools are, uh, are accommodating, uh, but, but this is not an isolated case. No, of course not. There are many schools which are telling their children, standing up in front of the school, the head teacher is telling them, you know, you're nine year old, you're 10 year old, you don't have to fast. So they're, they're trying to convince them that they should not fast. Now, this is not the job of the school. You, parents are not sending their children to school to be uh, told by the head teacher as to how they should practice their religion or whether they should do it or not. Sure. It is yes. none of their, yeah, according to our sort of system, if you like, mm -hmm. it is none of their business, quite frankly, whether the child prays or doesn't pray. It's not for them to convince them one way or the other. Sure. Dr. Can I take um, Dr. Shamim now? Would you like to comment on some of this? We've got some questions coming through, which I'll read out very shortly, but if you'd like to comment on some of the stuff that you just said. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think, I think the, just to set the context of prevent, um, I mean, obviously prevent actually has gone through two distinctive stages. Um, you know, obviously the first stage was very much to do with um, uh, tackling violent radicalization, uh, violent extremism. And then you've basically got a, um, a, a type of prevent um, a policy that basically came on, uh, a, through a, what was known as the contest two uh, strategy that basically talked about how uh, non-violent uh, radicalization uh, it can also be seen as a, a, a major threat, a major issue. Uh, so, so I think, I think there's, there's two elements of, of prevent. The first stage was very much to do with tackling violent extremism. The second stage was very much to do with, sorry, second phase was very much to do with tackling non-violent aspects of, of, of radicalization. So you've got issues such as, you know, tackling, you know, uh, anybody that questions democracy, anybody that questions kind of issues to do with LGBT rights, uh, for those people who question notions of Britishness is, is also seen as, uh, seen through uh, lenses of, of the problematic. Um, so that's, that, those are the two things to, to actually kind of bear in mind. And, and also to look at how, you know, the sinister way in which, you know, that particular logic actually works because the logic actually assumes that, that there is a conveyor belt approach to radicalization. But on the one hand, someone basically starts to grow a beard, you know, starts to fast or starts to pray, and then gradually they basically go down this con conveyor belt approach and then they become you know, a, a fully fledged kind of ISIS member, et cetera. Sure. I mean, despite the fact that there is no academic, ac uh, academic evidence to actually substantiate that, that you know, that, that there is a process that individuals will actually go through radicalization, but nevertheless, that, 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 that becomes part of the logic, it becomes part of the logic through which Muslims are actually kind of a, a, a viewed, the way in which Muslims are actually kind of perceived as well. So, so within the concept of school, as, as, mm -hmm. as I hear is rightly kind of pointing out, within the concept of the schools, these small issues to do with fasting and growing in the beards and praying, etc., cetera, um, should be understood within the broader kind of context of how the prevent logic basically works. The grammar of logic, so the grammar of prevent assumes that if we don't actually tackle those issues in the first instance, it will somehow morph into a much bigger, uh, a bigger, uh, a bigger problem. Okay. Um, so for, for those people that study kind of terrorism and, and how, uh, how, how kind of radicalization basically works, etc., mm -hmm. people have actually very much questioned that this, that, you know, the question, this logic of, sure. of, of the conveyor, you know, the conveyor belt, conveyor belt approach. Fantastic. Right. We've got quite, quite a few questions coming through. I mean, people can say it by directly by Zoom or on the chat. Let me just reach out, um, read out some of the questions. One from Aisha, uh, well, the first one from Sumera. What is the way forward to, now to desecuritize education, obtain justice for the victims of the Trojan horse atrocity uh, in terms of political campaigning and lobbying? Uh, an interesting question from Aisha. Would you agree that the securitization of education seems to be a global issue? Um, and she's, she's tuning in from Pakistan. Even in Pakistan, we seem to have strict measures implementing in all education institutions on the pretext of the war on terror, uh, including barbed wire, surveillance ca uh, cameras, security guards, uh, and so, um, how was the, this is from Aisha? How was the impact of 
all of this on the self-esteem of Muslim students handled by Muslim educational leaders in charge. Uh, and finally, um, what happened to the pupils of the Trojan Horse schools? Were they provided with support uh, or have their education experiences since been followed or, or so? There's more questions coming through, but if, if either of you folks would like to comment, uh, maybe Tahir by first. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, the, the what is the uh, one of the questions was about wh what do we do about that, if you like, yeah. if that is the situation we find ourselves in, and that's an important question. First of all, uh, the entire policy, uh, which actually systematically discriminates against Muslims, has to be challenged, has to be questioned, and has to be uh, you know resisted and opposed um, uh, for the sake of Muslim children in these schools. Now, one of the uh, important aspects within the teaching uh, profession, within the teaching setting, of course, is that there is a trust relationship between a teacher and a pupil, between a teacher and a parent, between school and a parent. What this whole um, approach has done is that it has undermined this particular relationship. Hence, in one of the schools in London, to give an example, um, uh, there was a very topical issue to do with some terrorist attack in London, quite a big event. And um, the school wanted, one of the teachers wanted to discuss that as a weekly event. And when she said, you know, what important things have happened in the weekend, can we talk about that? In, a, in, in the school, in the class, the vast majority of children were of the Muslim faith background. Not one of the children mentioned that particular incident which related to some kind of a you know a terrorist attack of some description and so the teacher was a bit shocked that how come none of these children want to talk about this so she kind of then she let the matter drop at the time but anyway what she discovered later was that there had been discussion that some some of the children said that there are discussions with their parents and their parents told them not to discuss islam or any of these issues at all in school now Education is supposed to be a place where children grow, develop, they make mistakes, they grow and develop in a trusting relationship with the teacher. They're able to ask the teacher anything. And the fact that the children express those things means that you can actually possibly rectify some of those views and perspectives that they might hold. This whole culture actually is counterproductive. Uh, you know, for, for the very purposes for which it is being introduced, because the Muslim children are not expressing their Islam. They're now uh, suppressing their Islam and don't want to express it within the school. And they're being told by their parents not to talk about these things either. And the schools think they're on a victory parade because they are actually are trying, they are, they are they're able to, if you like, quash I think Tahir Bai must have pressed the button there. Um, uh, he'll try and fix that. In the meantime, I'll go to Shamim Bai. Dr. Shamim, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Bai. Uh, yeah, I, th I think, I mean, for me, uh, I think there needs to be a, a full root and branch, a, um, a post-mortem of, of, of the, uh, the, um, uh, the Trojan Horse Saga. Uh, I mean, so for example, I mean, a, the, the question I asked about the, um, the, what's happened to the pupils of, 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 the, of the year that the Trojan horse scandal actually kind of happened. Uh, I think what basically needs to happen is that more research um, needs to actually done on, on, on the potential impact that that national or international saga actually had to happen on, on individual, individual pupils. You've got teachers, you've got head teachers, you've got you've got governors also that were basically hounded out. Uh, some of these people that I've spoken to are having difficulty trying to locate jobs, etc. Uh, yes. And what we need to do is an internal kind of analysis of the way in which Muslims also treated these particular individuals as well. Right. Um, so I think I think you know we have to do within academic uh, a, a study. We talk about the kind of multiple critiques. Yes, we have to kind of critique the way in which the racial logic basically works within uh, within the state apparatus. But internally, we also have to kind of talk about the way in which we've treated our own Muslim kind of uh, a, um, a, a colleagues and brothers and sisters, you know, we, through a very kind of uh, suspect suspect lights, etc. So I think that needs to happen as well. But also, I think the learning point arising from that 
is that we as, as a community really need to upskill ourselves, you know, in terms of a, 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 in terms of critical thinking, but also kind of investigative journalism, uh, have the ability to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to have, to have a complete infrastructure in where we, we can actually kind of report these. We need a kind of uh, intellectual critical mass that allows us to kind of debate and discourse and, and actually kind of move forward, if right. you like. Um, so I think there's, there's some wider things kind of arising from that, but I think just in short, I think there's something that just, uh, uh, that Malcolm so it, it, it became like a divide, you know, a divide and rule strategy, good Muslim, bad Muslim. Yeah. That's yeah. Came out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but I think, I think we, 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 we as, as a community, we, we need to kind of learn some serious lessons from that as well and, and mm -hmm. not let kind of history kind of uh, actually repeat itself. Sure. Uh, um, We've got a question from Yahya. Um, I'll read it out and then I'll try and I'll unmute it. Actually, Yahya, would you like to, yeah, Bismillah, would you like to speak about your question, please? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so I come to, uh, to you, Shamim Bai, and to Tahir if he's, if he's with us. You can hear me, right? Yes, yes we, we can. can. Yahya, yeah, right. You're right. Yeah, fine, alhamdulillah. Um, so I'm sorry, I missed most of the event. My, my mother-in-law wanted to go for a walk, so I had to take her, sorry. Very nice. <laughs> I wanted to ask, um, theoretically spe speaking, would, what would a working compromise on SRE teaching in state schools um, look like uh, that could respect the freedoms of religious communities to differ, uh, given that in our present moment is a securitized one? Um, so my question really is, can anything more on this be done in the interim without scrapping prevent or, or counter extremism? Or, or is that, are they bound up together? Yeah, uh, do you want me to take that? Um, is that right? Or is... Yes, please, yes, please take that. I'm just okay. looking at yeah, Tarheim's connection. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's um, I mean, the SRE for those people who are not kind of familiar with it is, is a section relationship kind of education, uh, if you like. Um, now, my point is this, is that um, it's the way in which the SRE is actually kind of talked about. If, if we take kind of the values discourse, the values discourse, um, there's three ways in which you can actually understand the values. The first way uh, about, about values is it comes top down. The state decides what should go into the SRE curriculum. The state decides how it should be taught. The state decides the pedagogy. The state decides uh, a, the, the boundaries and the parameters. And then it basically tells everybody to actually accept that. So that's a very kind of top-down approach. The second approach that you can basically have, and, and people who've, who've, who've studied uh, the education of values, etc., talk about how values is basically a uh, bottom-up. Uh, how that there's a consensus that actually is reached amongst the people and then that consensus is negotiated, mediated, and then there's that, that there is agreement that's actually kind of reached, if you like. My understanding of the SRE so far is, is it's a very much of a top-down approach. Um, and what needs to basically happen is that there needs to be some form of kind of consensus, to some form of agreement that, 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 you know, that, that needs to be kind of raised, if you like. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the current model as it stands, I think for those people who study education, who study the values in education, uh, there's a really interesting book called Values in Education and Education in Values. It's, it's written by um, uh, one of my kind of PhD, a, a supervisor, Professor Mark Halstead. And he's, he's kind of, you know, the key kind of expert in this area. And he talks about this idea of how values is, you know, our, our values, certain values in society are actually kind of developed but what's the best way of sustaining certain values within, you know, within an education, educational context. But I think, I think also to, to add a very other point, um, I think there's been a huge critique of the way in which, you know, uh, you know, the no outside is, uh, a curriculum has been kind of talked about, even amongst the kind of feminists the NG, and the LGBT uh, activists. I'm thinking of the likes of Judith Butler, over mm -hmm. in the States made a really interesting intervention to say that, mm -hmm. that we should be mindful of the way in which we use certain kind of liberal logic uh, as a way of, uh, mm -hmm. of, of a, a demonizing, essentializing, but also justifying kind of, you know, uh, um, Islamophobia as well. 
So I think, I think it's not just, it's not a binary, it's not always Muslims on the one hand and then you've got other, you know, like uh, the LGBT community on the other. Uh, there are, you know, academics, there are activists that are basically concerned about the way in which uh, and the method through which that these kind of things are actually kind of a, 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 um, a rolled out. Fantastic. If I can bring back Taj I don't know if that again. answers your question. Yeah, yeah, right. do, do you think it can, do you think it can actually, uh, any movement be made on it without scrapping prevent or seek counter extremism? That was my specific question. Mm. Oh, no, I, th no I, I think it's quite, quite clear that from the way in which that the new No Outsiders curriculum actually came out and how kind of deeply embedded that was within the, within the prevent policy. Um, these all things are actually kind of embedded together. I, I cannot actually foresee uh, you, uh, a, a sex and relationship education that can be sustained um, that doesn't necessarily, uh, a, um, th that doesn't take a securitized kind of format, if you like. I think both of these stuff are so embedded together that you do need, need that kind of desecuritized kind of approach to uh, sex and relationship education. I'm not one of those people that basically say, look, we shouldn't have sex and relationship education. I think those should be culturally specific uh, and uh, those should be kind of developed within, within, within the respective kind of faith communities and there needs to be a form of negotiation that actually kind of takes place and, and the way in which, you know, what should be taught and how it should be taught, etc. And, you know, before we reach that position, the Muslim community itself really needs to sit down and discuss of what needs to be on the table. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so we do need to develop our own kind of expertise. We do need to kind of develop our own way in which we can actually approach the sex and relationship kind of education. So do you think we need a Muslim curriculum or something like for state, for states, for state schools or? Uh, no, I, I, I think it needs to be, it needs, I mean, we, the different experts need to actually kind of come together. Right. Um, I think, you know, um, in, in the past, people have talked about dialogue, whereby, you know, uh, the Muslims enter a dialogue with the state. I think what needs to happen is a polylogue. There needs to be a dialogue between different individuals, different players within the Muslim community. Interesting, yeah. Within, you know, within the LGBT community, but also within, 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 within the broader community as well. You know, there needs to be a, you know, a, a, a detailed kind of polylogue that needs to take place. Sure. I want to bring back... Um uh, Tahir Alam, uh, we, just before you got disconnected, uh, we had a question from um, Yahya Bert about, um, he wanted to ask, theoretically speaking, what would be a working compromise on SRE teaching in state schools that could respect the freedoms of religious communities to differ, given that we're in a securitized present? Can anything move on uh, on this in the interim without scrapping prevent or CE? I mean, the subject matter at hand actually is nothing new. Um, I spent almost a decade um, from 2004 till I sort of, um, you know, left the arena, as it were, following the Trojan Horse affair, um, uh, at attending uh, lobbying meetings, attending meetings with the Department for Education, meeting the Secretary of State, responding to consultations. Uh, this, uh, you know, the, the idea of there being a dialogue, if you like, between the policymakers and between the Muslim community, uh, you know, there's maybe an assumption that that hasn't happened. It has been happening. And, you know, I, and uh, I've been involved in a lot of that over that particular period, and I've spent a great deal of time doing that. And one of the things that I produced as part of that consultation was to deal with all these issues, including sex and relationship education. I wrote a book called uh, you know, meeting the needs of Muslim pupils in state schools. And, uh, and, and that document was published in 2007. So this is not a new topic or a new debate or anything of the kind. Um, so these topics are not new, but what, is, what has changed, of course, and, um, is that there has been a policy shift towards intolerance by, 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 by the government, if you, if you like, in that sense. So we're not deking, dealing with uh, ignorance issues here because sometimes... You know, when there is discrimination, when there is belligerence uh, in people trying to impose one particular point of view on another community, knowing full well that actually they have a different view, a different perspective, uh, they simply are, is what we've seen in the LGBT cases, for example, here in Birmingham, mm -hmm. and even in the Trojan Horse affair, was that people saying, look, we got more power than you have. We're going to basically shove this down your throat. Now, 
when you talk, so, so how do you move from that position to one where there is an acknowledgement of equality of citizenship? Because that's the real issue here. The real issue here is of discrimination, of there being a belief, a perspective, that Muslims should not have the same rights as other normal citizens in so, somehow they are inferior citizens or are not citizens. So, so this is the issue that we actually are dealing with. Uh, so unless you know there's a shift as far as uh, you know uh, as far as this this point is concerned, there can't really be an improvement as such. So where do we make it? So the Muslim where does the Muslim community? Yahya Bert's question is an important one. Requires a, a pretty detailed response actually. Probably not for for sort of um, you know for one or two minutes. But the point is that the so what is being asked of the Muslim community? Uh, and I've looked into this quite deeply. What they're asking the Muslim community to do is to accept that you know homosexuality is okay, accept that pornography is norm, accept all of those things, and uh, do not oppose them within the within the school within a curriculum setting. Right. There are resources produced by some Muslims, written resources, which actually put the Muslim view across. There has to be an element of you know lakum dinukum wal yadin is the way the Prophet the Quran puts it. Right. But there are some things which cannot be bridged. So we can't make the haram halal because there is a political um, requirement for us to do so. So, well, the, 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 so, so, the, so the only common ground that there can be going forward, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, is that there must be a mutual respect sure. for, for difference. And this is what we are not seeing. Mm -hmm. So the state apparatus is being used to actually uh, to, to tell the Muslims you know, you can't have that, you can't have this, you can't say that, otherwise we'll do this to you, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we got so, 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 so this is not about, uh, this is not a, so this is where we are in terms of the relationship, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And unless that shifts, um, you know, we can't make the haram uh, halal. Mm -hmm. um, and what we have, what we've seen, of course, is that parents actually telling their children not to listen to the teachers. In the Parkview case, for example, here, Parkfield case, uh, in the parents actually actively told their children not to listen to Mr. Muffat. So when the children go into the Muffet Muffat's class, one girl, she walked out of the class. So as soon as Mr. Muffat started his... So um, who's, who's you know, Mr. Muffat? The, yeah, Mr. Muffat is the, is the person who was leading the entire campaign, right. who wrote the resources uh, in this field. Mm -hmm. uh, when the children were walking into the class, you know, some of the children, they basically stood up and their parents told them to walk out of the class as soon as he starts his you know, uh, his rainbow games in the school, uh, sorry, rainbow, rainbow stuff in the, um, in the classroom saying it's all okay and, and, you know, you can be Muslim and gay and all the rest of it, mm -hmm. to walk out. So some of the children actually stood up and walked out of the class. That sent a message to the other children as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, you see, in an education setting, you have to have a trust relationship. And this kind of belligerence has created a culture of mistrust and we don't currently have a solution because people think we should just follow what they are doing and their wisdom is right. You know, they're, they're educating us, they're civilizing the backward uh, Muslim community. So far as, you know, if this kind of attitude persists, mm -hmm. you know, the conflicts, if you like, the mistrust is going to continue. And, uh, you know, more and more parents, I hope, to be honest, um, because education is a value-rich enterprise. It's not a value-free enterprise, it's a value-rich enterprise. The question is, which values are going to be promoted, which values are going to be uh, allowed to be expressed or accepted within the school setting? And in any scenario where there's going to be harmony in a multiracial, multi-faith society, you have to give, if democracy has any weight, and if fairness and justice have any weight, you have to allow a diversity of opinion and allow people to hold a different view and not be vilified for holding that particular view, not be demonized for holding that particular view, and not be referred to prevent as a radicalized, uh, you know, as, as, a, as somebody who's on a road to radicalization, on a conveyor belt to radicalization, because you want to pray five times a day, because you want to fast at the age of nine, Sure. Uh, or because you, you believe that homosexuality is completely wrong, morally speaking. Sure. Can I take these two comments and questions and is, do both of you? How, how can we make these issues more widely understood in the Muslim and non-Muslim communities? That's from Farah. And someone called AA, from the panelist's experience, looking at the future of Islamic schooling for Muslim children with COVID fighting and many Muslim independent schools will certainly force to be shut down due to financial issues. Would you... Uh, would it be, 
would be recommended that the free school model or VI voluntary aided model uh, is worth going down that route or not? Or would you say homeschooling is best? What would you suggest? Either of them, yeah, either of you. Uh, I think, mm, I mean, I, I'm speaking as, as someone who's interested in social science and sociology and history and politics, etc., and philosophy. I think as when, when it comes to those, uh, the humanities, I think the Muslim communities are quite, uh, um, uh, not necessarily behind, but I think there, there's, a, there's a lot of catching up to do. Uh, so I, th I think I would encourage any, any uh, platforms like this, uh, like, like the Islamic Circle, um, a platform that you've actually got, as a way of educating Muslim communities about, about broader issues to do with humanities, philosophy, politics, and sociology. So I think, I think that there's, 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 that, that needs to enter the public conversation that needs to become the kind of the, the dominant kind of discourse, if you like. But also how certain, I, I mean, in terms of I, uh, how policy actually is constructed, how it works, how it's con you know, contested. You know, Tahib, I started off by talking about, you know, the Education Reform Act of 1988. So there's the whole, I mean, these things don't actually kind of come out of a vacuum. There's a whole long historical, social, uh, political context that this, these ideas are actually kind of born out of, if you like. So I think that our mosques, our community centers, you know, needs to play a more of an active role in recognizing and appreciating, you know, uh, you know the tools that, that, that that are available within the humanities and social sciences as a way of kind of deconstructing, you know, the normative kind of the, the model of, of how Muslim communities actually kind of exist and function. Um, but also there's kind of signs of hope. I mean, there's various scholarships that's given up from students, et cetera, um, you know, in terms of the humanities and arts. Um, so I think, I think there needs to be kind of broader kind of a, a, a experience that needs to kind of emerge. But also, I think there's a lot for us to learn from various other communities as well. So, for example, from the Black experience in the United States, the Irish experience, etc. Various, you know, kind of diasporic communities as well. Uh, you know, studying how how they actually went through similar kind of issues throughout history can also kind of offer some way forward as far as as far as kind of communities is concerned as well. So, I think that's 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 a kind of a, a perhaps kind of a, a more of a kind of a general general point, but I think the second question is is perhaps too uh, too important um, for us to kind of just give a kind of soundbite response. I think that 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 needs a, a complete a, a complete se a, a separate session that needs to kind of unpick you know the future of schooling, yeah. this future of neoliberalism and schooling, you know the yeah. future of COVID-19 and how that's going to affect the independent kind of Muslim Muslim school sector. Yeah. So I think that I think that's, that's <clears throat> very We'll important. probably have to have another session for that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tahir, would you like to comment on the um, um, yeah. the last two comments here please? Yeah, if I begin with the uh, the second bit of the question which Dr. Shamim just mentioned now and just uh, leave my response uh, restricted to that. Um, you know, what has the response been of the Muslim parents in response to what is actually happening? Um, I know that some parents um, you know, have, uh, you know, have, have uh, those who could afford it, they have taken their children out of those schools uh, because they don't want their children uh, being belligerently, uh, you know, undermined, their own culture, their own values, their own faith being undermined in such a belligerent manner. And those that could have, uh, many parents who could afford that, they've taken their children out of those schools and they sent them to some independent schools, Muslim schools. Those numbers obviously are small because people, parents can't afford those. And sometimes, you know, the quality can be an issue in terms of the quality, not quality of education really, because Muslim schools generally are, you know, uh, are sub sub significantly above uh, in terms of academic achievement and so on than your normal average state schools. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, the finance is an issue mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and the quality can be an issue in some cases. Uh, so some parents, a few parents have done that, a minority of parents. Other parents have begun to educate their children um, on these kinds of issues actually more at home because they feel that, uh, you know, that this, because the school now is in, 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 in many cases trying to deliberately undermine their Islam, and the moral values that the parents have tried to instill in their children, they, they, they are making more of an effort, I think, 
to you, actually you to don't think what do kind of islam you don't think it's a uh, what version of islam because i don't think schools are undermining islam do you feel well if they well they are undermining islam if they are preventing children from praying of course they are undermining islam if according to the statutory guide uh, statutory law you are required to say i don't know act uh, offer an act of islamic collective worship to muslim children uh, you know, after getting a determination and the school basically says, oh, this is not a Muslim school. We're not going to have any of that here. Well, of course you are undermining Islam because what you do, how are you undermining it? You're not undermining it by saying that Islam is rubbish or Islam is evil or Muslims are evil or the Quran is bad. This is not how it happens. Okay, so this is how it, I, I'll tell you exactly how it happens. Sure. The Muslim child goes into the school. There is no expression for them to be Muslim inside the school. What impression educationally, don't forget we are dealing with children here. So what impression does a four, five, six, eight, nine-year-old get when the school tells them, actually, your religion is not important. You can't express that here. I must keep that subdued. It tells them that, A, number one, that this is not important. Yeah. And number two, that this is not relevant. And that this is not important in real life. And second, and more importantly, what it teaches them is that if they want to get further in life, if they want to be successful, then it is better they don't express themselves in those terms. Right. And this is a very common practice, and I can really reproduce this almost at will, mm -hmm. you know, almost but, at will. But, so but what I'm saying to you is that there is an undermining going on in, that, mm -hmm. in, a, in an indirect way, if you, in, in that manner. Sure, but we have a good example, the Star Academy. Is that, is that, is that one of the ways forwards? I mean, the Star is Well, I, I, mean, I don't want to comment directly on Star Academies because it's, it's a topic in its own right, really, if you talk about, uh, their ethos and so on. So the Star Academies academically are very successful schools. They also have, mm -hmm. in some of the schools, they have some very successful, um, particularly the original schools, they have a uh, very uh, good ethos in some of those schools. But uh, Star Academies, you know, overall, uh, you know, have been on a, sli a sliding scale. You know, their approach to, is, uh, to them being Muslim schools because they apply under a free school uh, a designation which says that they are Muslim free school. Um, you know, uh, there's hardly anything Muslimness about, you know, some of those schools certainly is what the parents have told me. Uh, and that's not for every school, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but nonetheless, there are issues around that as well. But, but, but perhaps that's another discussion for another day mm -hmm. when you can have the Star Academies people on the other side and sure. they can be questioned, I think. It's not yeah. fair for me to pass a judgment on yeah. them. But nonetheless, you know, there are issues around those things, mm -hmm. um, you know, which are very, very real indeed. So, for example, mm -hmm. in the Star Academy, say, free school, uh, children don't have to pray, mm -hmm. as an example. So it's an Islamic school, mm -hmm. a Muslim school, but nobody has to pray unless they want to. So you would think that as part of the ethos here, as part of the daily prayers, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the equivalent of the Christian idea of the mass here, yeah? mm -hmm. you would think that that'd be, there'd be some part of the ethos which would be compulsory, yeah? Uh, no, there isn't. Right. Okay. We're coming towards the end. So summaries. Okay. So let's start off with Dr. Shamim. Uh, would you like to summarize uh, your thoughts and reflections on this issue and maybe some steps, practical steps going forward? We have a lot I of people. Mean, from, yeah. I think as, as, I, as I started off um, by saying that um, I, th I think the current juncture that we've, we've hit at the moment now, as far as you know, the academic study of Muslim communities and education is concerned. I mean, we've gone through a long history of the way in which different framing, different ways in which the Muslim child has been kind of perceived. I mean, obviously it started off with assimilation, then integration, multiculturalism, anti-racism, uh, community cohesion. It's, it's had a whole history of the way, different ways in which the state, the relationship between the state and the Muslim child. Uh, I think the current, Kind of juncture that we're actually in at the moment now is a juncture of securitization where the muslim child is actually kind of seen through a lens of securitization but also it's a deeply kind of problematic lens if you like because it doesn't necessarily address the kind of the broader educational needs of the muslim child uh, it uh, constructs the child as you know as as, yes. as, 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 a, as a as a as a problem that needs to be solved you know, that's, 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 that's the way in which that's the relationship between the education and uh, a debates and, and Muslim communities. I think, I think looking forward, I think what, what 
perhaps needs to kind of happen is that there are certain aspects of the curriculum mm. that needs to be kind of challenged. Um, yeah. And I think, yes, I mean, the, the SRE might be one, but I, I would basically say there are broader other areas that needs to be kind of looked at and challenged as well. I mean, say, for example, how English is actually taught. I mean, English in, in some of these schools is still taught from the point of view of dead white men. Um, so, I mean, so there needs to be a discussion about the way in which, you know, how different voices or the voices of the other can also be kind of incorporated within, you know, within the English curriculum. Same with history, same with mathematics, uh, and same with various other kind of subjects as well. You know, I'm not talking about, you know, Ismail Raj Farooqi's Islamization of education, because obviously that's, that's been kind of uh, contested by various academics. What I'm basically saying is that the, the school curriculum needs to reflect mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the Muslim child. And it, and it really, really pains me mm -hmm. how when you look at school curriculums within a Muslim school, yeah, and how they still continue. I mean, there's, there's, there's very little space there mm -hmm. of how we, we develop a curriculum that basically addresses the issue of, uh, of how does Islamic literature look mm -hmm. from the point of view of a Muslim school? You know, yes, I mean, hijabs and salahs are quite important, but these are other big, big important issues that mm -hmm. really needs to be kind of, uh, you know, thought of, because uh, 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 these, these are not easy, you know, these are not easy, easy tasks. You know, there needs to be a whole group of academics that basically needs to kind of unpick this. But also, I think that there is a broader point about, well, what is the, um, the objective of education? Is the objective of education a, a mere economic transaction? You know, do we expect a Muslim child to go through the secondary schools and university education so that they can actually get a, a, a job at Lehman Brothers? or you know in you know for for uh, Deloitte etc is that the matrix of success that mm. we are kind of associating and if so I think that's a very deeply kind of worrying one because mm. what we are basically doing is internalizing an educational model based mm. upon a uh, kind of neoliberalism what needs to happen I think is that we need to kind of redefine the objectives I mean if you want the democracies of education what is the, the the approach what is the end product that we expect you know, do we want a child which is kind of a wholesome, uh, you know, who's kind of critical of the kind of environment, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who has the kind of the problems of some of the contemporary kind of issues, if you like, whether so, it be banking crisis, whether it be, mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know, the coronavirus, etc. We need to develop kind of communities, you know, uh, who are wise, wisdom communities. That, yeah. you know uh, perhaps that we need to be kind of you know nurturing so i think that i mean you mentioned the star academy any academy that basically goes into a partnership with the government mm -hmm. has to kind of endorse this neoliberal logic uh, you know it has to kind of accept that the model of education is an economic transaction um, I mean, there are various other models that are actually out there, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, you know, in the States, you know, in, 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 in Sweden and various other kind of places as well. Mm. So I think that, that then, I mean, these, these are not kind of easy issues. These, these are big questions that need. Do you, and on that, I know we've got to get a round up by Tahir, but do you think there needs to be a conversation between Muslim schools and Muslims in state schools, those who are active in Muslims in state schools? There doesn't seem to be a connection here. There doesn't seem to be any com conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, even like the Muslim schools, there are two types of Muslim schools. There's this type of Muslim schools that are basically supported by the state. Right. You know, you know, uh, and then you've got the independent Muslim schools who are very small, you know, kind of run a very kind of small kind of a, a, a shoestring that yep. basically pop up one kind of a year and then they close the next year, etc. Yeah. Um, but I think there, there needs to be a whole conversation about what is, what do we want to achieve from a Muslim school? What do we want to achieve from Muslims in state schools? And I'm very kind of, kind of a, 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 a skeptical of this kind of economic model of education, whereby everybody has this expectation that they will get a first class and end up, you know, making their millions working for, you know, Goldman Sachs or, you know, a, 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 whatever you it's a Bills Goldman Sachs, brother. Okay, so Tahir Bai, uh, would you like to um, comment, please, and final comments and thoughts and reflections? Yeah. I, I think regardless of what the education model is, really, uh, from a philosophical and from a practical point of view, from a parent's point of view as well, the idea of success here is very, very important in education. So the reason why children are getting up 7 o'clock in the morning 
and then coming up to 430 and they do that for so many years is because the importance that's placed on the idea of success. Now, the current model, model of education, as Dr. Shamim rightfully pointed out, is basically the idea of, based on the objective that, oh, you know, if you want to get a job, then you need to be involved in education and do well in education. This is what it is. It's about getting a job, okay? Um, so I think as Muslims, of course, uh, this is not a, an objective which actually is acceptable. Um, you know, it may be a critical part of it, and most, people, most parents have adopted or accepted this, to be honest, as a, as a goal for their, for, their, for their son, daughter, going to school for, you know, 12 years and beyond. From a Muslim point of view, from an Islamic point of view, and people who established Muslim schools as well, they consider the shakhsiya al-Islamiya to be a very important part of education. So education is not simply about success. Uh, a, a true uh, definition of success includes the success in this life, you might say economically and so on, but it also includes success in the hereafter as well. And therefore, the shakhsiya al-Islamiya, uh, child's iman, their morals, their values, their character, their connectedness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how they conduct themselves uh, you know, uh, in, in the world and with other people, all those things are important. So we believe in a holistic kind of approach. And the people who have established Muslim schools, those are some of the aims that they've had in mind that the Muslimness of the child is important. We want our children to be good Muslims and to be good engineers, doctors, or whatever, so they can serve you know, themselves, their own families, and the wider society, and indeed the world. So. Uh, the Muslim parents need to really focus on what is our vision for education, what is our definition of education, because that definition, that vision, then determines what successful education is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a child, a, a person can, I don't know, get a PhD, but if that particular, you know, uh, uh, person who's got the PhD, you know, he's a liar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's rude to other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, he's defrauding other people. Is he educated? Right. I would say no. I, this guy is a complete jahil. Mm -hmm. But he's got PhDs. So according to the model that we are following, he's reached the highest echelons of learning. He is now a doctor, if you like, yeah, mm -hmm. or a professor. So what is his professorship? What is his doctorship worth? He's got no manners, no values, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And he's going around abusing people. Mm -hmm. So the point is that what I'm trying to emphasize here mm -hmm. is that we need to redefine realign, rethink our idea of what education is and what successful education is and what the goals should be. Mm -hmm. And it is against those goals that we should be educating our children. Wow. The fact that our child got a job at the end of the day, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is, is, is an important win, if you like, in that sense, but mm -hmm. it shouldn't be the only or it's a very deficient form of education, if you like, when the, when the goal is only restricted to a material gain Mm -hmm. rather than the development of character, development of spirituality, because the akhirah is real. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not imaginary, it is real. So if you believe that the human being well, this came about through some kind of an accident, and there is no afterlife, and there's no accountability for any of the actions of the human being, Fair then enough. fine, okay, then give a job, and become a surgeon or whatever, mm -hmm. or become a businessman, and make lots of money, and then eventually you drop dead. Sure. That's a Thank different you. kind of way of looking at the, at the, at the world, really. Mm -hmm. So we have to see the education through the Quranic viewpoint. Sure. And, and I'll finish with this last comment that, mm -hmm. you know, the, the famous dua of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, you know, make my progeny Muslim, yeah? Yes. Make my progeny Muslim. So as parents, of course, it is our duty to raise our children upon the high principles of Islam in an uncompromising manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so this is what the aim of the parents should be, to raise their children to be a good Muslim, to be a good citizen, to be a good human being. So he's an asset. We don't see contradiction in any of those things. Thank you so much uh, to both Dr. Shamim and uh, Tahir Alam as well, and all those who came and um, viewed as well. Um, just a reminder, if you want to get a recording of the uh, recording, please leave your email address if you're not registered, number one. What also I've, I've gathered over the last couple of sessions we've had on related to education, um, there seems to be a, a real interest now. We've come to a point, I think we probably have to, ref since 1971, the education conference in Makkah, we probably need some sort of another 
big education conference forum to reevaluate things is that is that something i'm i'm beginning to see that we had a session on transatlantic islamic education schools uh, experiences and that's something that was coming out and and today's session again we're seeing that mentioned or as a feeling is that do you feel that do you feel that like that's coming out dr shamim and Bahir? yeah most definitely and i think i think i mean uh, obviously, we've talked about education within the context of securitization. I mean, th th there is a broader context, you know, the conversation that needs to have about education and its philosophy. You know, what's, what is the philosophical underpinnings of education that we've actually got? I mean, the relationship between education and uh, artificial intelligence. I mean, uh, you know, the relationship between education and futures. Uh, I mean, so 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 I, I think I think you're right. I mean, the the um, the, the 71 um, the 72 I think it was the the education summit in, in in Mecca was was quite useful. I mean, there's some in, interesting kind of documents that basically came out, uh, you know, from that. But that is very very dated. I mean, it is very dated. You know, <laughs> Super dated in a number of in number of ways. But um, but I mean, that's that's the start. That's the starting point, really. And I, th I think I think I, th I think it's very really important. You know, for us to kind of continue to have those kind of conversations. Well, and interesting. Next week, we're hoping to have Professor Ziaudin Saddar. He's going to be delivering a session on rethinking reform in higher education, from oh, okay. Islamization to integration of knowledge. And yeah, yeah. um, we're hoping to have Dr. Abdullah Shahin, who's going to be hosting that as well. Oh, so, it'll be an interesting conversation between the two. Yeah, uh, on that subject. So um, stay in tune for that. But the most important thing, thank you so much, everyone. Um, if you'd like to receive a copy, please send us your email address if you're not already registered. Uh, the second thing is a reminder of tomorrow's session on the Ottomans. Um, we're going to be looking at Ottoman political theory uh, and also Islamic constitutionalism. It's modern, um, the, the Turks and how they approach the modern state as well, to some extent. Okay, so thank you very much. I wish you all the best and Make dua for us here when you go. Oh, okay. Jazakallah, assalamu alaikum.